secret sharing schemes was not uh, his main uh, subject of research, although uh, one of his first uh, papers was on uh, computational secret sharing scheme. The, his, while he was still doing his undergrad uh, studies in India. Uh, so uh, in a series of uh, results, uh, we see the quarters to Andrew and you uh, and Hot they uh, uh, gave a surprising upper bound for secret chain scheme. Uh, previously for nearly 30 years, the upper bound was two to the N and they showed that uh, it's the up bound is two to the C2 at the end with the C is uh, smaller than one. Very surprising and a breakthrough result. And uh, let's, uh, yeah, we, we're not telling us about that. Okay, um, thanks Amos. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and thanks Daniel and, uh, and the PC for, uh, for inviting me to speak. It's a real honor. Um, uh, I just wanna sort of say, can, can everyone hear me well? Loud and clear. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Beautiful. All right. So, um, so as Amos said, uh, you know, I uh, this is not my main research focus. I but uh, but you know, this is uh, this is a problem that uh, that I started uh, sort of thinking about uh, from the time I was a sophomore. You know, like completely clueless sophomore. And uh, one of the first papers I read was uh, Amos and uh, Yuval's paper. Uh, from 2001 on nonlinear secret sharing, and that really was what uh, sort of captured my imagination. Of course, I couldn't solve any of these problems, and it, it actually took uh, Tianran and Hotek to uh, to do the hard work and uh, and, uh, uh, and and solve the things. Um, so, so I'm happy to sort of uh, talk about this, this this series of works. It is uh, it is it is uh, it is actually a series of three papers that uh, that appear in Crypto Europe, Crypto in Stock in the last uh, two years. Okay, so let's uh, let's get started. Um, Okay, so we've uh, heard about secret sharing uh, quite a bit from the from the last session, but uh, nevertheless, let me sort of uh, define it. Let me set the stage. Um, uh, secret sharing is a is a wonderful primitive in information theoretic cryptography, uh, where you have a dealer um, who has a secret B, and you should think about B as a bit throughout this uh, this talk. And what the dealer wants to do is uh, is he wants to run a randomized procedure on the bit B uh, and create a set of n shares that uh, you each share you give to, uh, uh, to one party, there are n parties. Um, and what you want is that uh, any authorized subset of parties can get together, pull their shares together, they can recover the bit B, uh, but that's it. No other, no not authorized subset of parties has any information about the bit B. Okay? And in fact, this definition of which sets are authorized and which aren't is part of the sort of the definition of the, of the secret sharing scheme. Um, you know, the, you know, if you you must have heard about secret sharing scheme if you are in this community in one form or the other. Uh, in fact, secret sharing was defined by uh, Adi Shamir and, uh, and Bob Blakely, uh, um, you know, uh, back in the uh, 70s. Um, and the way they defined it is for what are now called threshold access structures, namely, uh, you know, the definition of access structures that any set of size more than or equal to T can reconstruct and only those sets can. So that's called the threshold secret sharing scheme. Uh, a few years later, uh, Ito, Saito and Ishizeki uh, generalized this to sort of general uh, uh, secret sharing schemes where the access structure can be an arbitrary collection of subsets of parties, except, uh, you know, if you, peer carefully at the, the definition, you realize that if a set of parties can recover the secret, so can a superset of the parties, right? They have strictly more information. Uh, so you can't have an arbitrary collection of subsets. You have to have a monotone collection of subsets. But of course, that's the only restriction. You can define an access structure to, to be an arbitrary uh, monotone collection of uh, subsets. Okay, and that's the sort of the focus of today's talk. Uh, in fact, again, just to set the stage and uh, and and to you know um, and lay some ground rules and notation, uh, I'm going to talk about subsets of uh, parties. Uh, I'm going to sort of you know that's the same as sort of an n-bit string for me, right? So the string is the characteristic vector of the subset. A uh, collection of subsets of n parties is a Boolean function on n-bits, right? So it's, it's, it's a function that says, given a subset, is it in the access structure or not? That's the Boolean function. 
And like we discussed before, not all Boolean functions are permissible, only monotone access structures, or in other words, monotone Boolean functions are valid access structures. Okay, so this, this is just sort of notation, just lay the, lay the, so the, uh, the terminology. And I'm really, in fact, going to go back and forth between sets and functions, um, you know, uh, and I really think about them as the same. All right, so, so like I said before, this talk is about general secret sharing schema, you know, those secret sharing for arbitrary monotone access structures. And really the key measure of interest uh, uh, in the literature and among people and for today certainly is the communication complexity of a secret sharing scheme, uh, which is the total size of all the shares that the dealer sends to all the parties. Okay, so this really is a communication complexity problem. Um, uh, so what do we know about secret, general secret sharing schemes? Uh, um, uh, back in the 80s, Benelow and Leiter uh, showed uh, a way to take a, a monotone Boolean formula that computes the, sort of computes the access uh, structure, computes the access function, um, and turn it into a secret sharing scheme for that access structure. And the feature is that uh, the size of the shares in the, in the secret sharing scheme was proportional to the size of the formula, the size of the monotone formula computing the access structure. Okay. You know, Shannon told us that, uh, you know, in the worst case, you need size two to the n formulas, even circuits actually, uh, to compute a worst case uh, access structure. In fact, true also for monotone functions. Uh, and therefore, you know, in the worst case, Benelow and Lecter will send two to the n uh, bits for the worst possible access structure. Uh, Karshmer and Wigdesson a few years later sort of came up with a different construction starting from uh, what's called a span program, rather a monotone span program. And again, they proved a very similar result. Um, uh, you know, uh, for monotone uh, span programs, the best known uh, construction for the worst access function, again, has size two to the n, no better than formulas. The counting lower bound, as we discussed, as Nat mentioned uh, at the end of last session, uh, is two to the n over two. Okay, so this is a little bit of a gap, but really both are exponential. So, you know, you, you see a theme in these uh, two results, right? So what the way people constructed secret sharing schemes for the large part uh, was to start from a computational model for the access structure or access function, so be it formulas or span programs, and turn it into a secret sharing scheme where the communication complexity, the share size, depends on the size of the, of the computational model, the size of the formula, or the size of the span program. Okay, that's the way things work. And really you have, to, you have to wonder why it must be the case that you know, a purely communication measure has to depend on the computational cost, right? I mean, it makes, you know, I mean, if you don't, if you haven't thought about this at all, if I just tell you this problem, it, it just sounds bizarre to you, right? I mean, surely one must be able to do better, right? Um, so, uh, so again, sort of, uh, you know, uh, to, 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 to tell you what the state of the art is, um, here's the graph. Um, the y-axis is, uh, is the share size. In fact, I'll, I'll write it in logarithmic, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a logarithmic scaling, right? Uh, and I, I'll scale it down by n. So log of the share size divided by n is the y-axis. And that's, you know, it can't be smaller than zero. And we know that uh, there is a two to the n size scheme. So that's one. That's log s over n is one. Okay, so that's what we know at this point. What is the lower bound? Do we know, do we know lower bounds on this stuff? And again, sort of uh, as uh, some of the previous talks mentioned, uh, Surmas in the 90s proved that uh, you can't do better than n squared over log n for the total share, share size. And uh, in the logarithmic scale, that is zero. Okay, so, so you know, the, the, the two to the n versus n squared over log n. In fact, the, I'd like to emphasize that we don't even know a better lower bound existentially for secret sharing. And that's very different from computational complexity where all kinds of, uh, sort of low, lower bounds are known existentially and what people spend a great deal of time on is to prove explicit, so lower bounds for explicit sort of functions, et cetera, et cetera. Even that is, so, so we should be even more embarrassed than the, than the CCC people um, uh, because we don't even know exist, better existential lower bounds, okay? Um, uh, and that's for sort of the left side is for unrestricted secret sharing. Yeah, so this, this is what we have been talking about so far. On the other hand, if you, if you restrict the secret sharing in a way that the, the share function, let's say is a linear function, and so is the reconstruct function, it turns out, 
um, you know, so the shared function takes a bit and randomness as input, right? And you want it to be a linear function on, on these guys. Then uh, again, I mean, you can't do any better in terms of upper bounds, right? Uh, it's still two to the n. Uh, but for lower bounds, we know that you can't do better than two to the n over two. And that's because of the tight relation between uh, monotone span programs and linear secret sharing schemes due to Kasper and Wigdeson. Uh, and so the counting lower bound on monotone span programs translates to a shared size lower bound on linear secret sharing schemes. So that's, the two to, that's how the two to the n over two comes in. So, you know, the gap is somewhat less embarrassing, but, but there's still the gap, right? So that's, that's that. Um, so the question really is, can you, do, can you do better? Like, which answer is correct? Is the low, can, I, can I improve the lower bound, the upper bound? What is the right answer, right? So um, what, uh, what we show in, um, uh, in the work with uh, Tianran Liu and uh, Hotek Wee, a series of three works, as I mentioned before, is that, uh, is that every monotone access structure on n parties, so you know, this is what we have been talking about uh, before, um, for every monotone access structure, there is a secret sharing scheme with share size less than two to the n bits. Okay, so, that's the, so we, we break this sort of two to the n thing that we've been stuck on uh, for many years. And concretely, if you want to sort of peer into it, it's uh, the share size is two to the 0.994 n bits. Okay, so maybe I should really have called my talk um, not breaking the secret sharing barrier, but rather a crack in the secret sharing barrier. But as we know, you know, all cracks have a tendency to widen and widen and widen and uh, you know, eventually break things. So it's a sort of a looking ahead down the line. All right, so that's the sort of the main theorem that, uh, that I'll talk about today. Um, we have several other results that came out of this uh, series of, uh, of works. Let me mention a few. Um, if you want linear secret sharing schemes, the same series of works also gives you a linear secret sharing scheme, but the share size is two to the 0.999 n bits. Okay, so, so in theory, when you say 0.99 n, that's a proxy for 0.9999, which is one, but that's not the case. It really is 0.9993 three nines, stops there, and that's that. Okay, yeah, so just, just to be clear, we are you know, on the same page. All right, so that's the linear secret sharing scheme. Of course, it does a little bit worse, but still it breaks the two to the n barrier. And finally, uh, we show that if you, so both of these results are for worst case access structures. For every access structure, we do this and that. What we also show is that there is a class of access structure, um, structures, pretty large class of access structures. And they require circuits or formulas or monotone span programs, et cetera, et cetera of size two to the n over two, size two to the omega n, but they have a secret sharing scheme with share size two to the square root n. So this really is conclusively breaking the uh, representation size uh, value. Right? You can't have a representation of size two to the square root n for, for, for this class of access structure, and yet you have a secret sharing scheme of that, uh, that size. Okay. And, you know, these are sort of individual results, uh, but all this emerges out of a general framework that connects uh, private information retrieval, which I'll define down the line, uh, conditional disclosure of secrets, also I'll define it down the line, and secret sharing. So this, this is sort of a very interesting sort of connection between all these, all these things, and that's sort of what we exploit. In fact, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, there are sort of, sort of other results down the line, um, they use these connections, they improve these connections uh, with very interesting ideas and they have, they have sort of made our results better. Um, uh, in particular, uh, the sequence of works, uh, the latest being uh, work of uh, Applebaum, Amos, uh, Baimal, um, uh, Odadnir and uh, Nati Peter, um, it's going to appear in stock. So you, have to, you should go to the talk next week, sort of an advertisement. And they improve our 0 0.994 to 0 0.637. Okay, sounds like you, you should be a little bit better. You should feel a little bit better with 0 0.637 than 0 0.994, okay. Um, and similar improvements for linear secret sharing schemes. It's what I most mentioned during the break. It's a uh, two to the 0 0.762 and secret sharing. So these works, use the framework, but they extend the framework in very, very interesting ways. And finally, there's a recent preprint of uh, Amos and uh, uh, Farash, I forget his first name, um, who show that most access structures, really like most access, there's not like a class of things, but most access structures have a secret sharing scheme with share size to the square root n bits. So that again, sort of vastly improves uh, 
our uh, third uh, theorem here. Okay, so that's a, sort of the state of the art at this point. Um, and uh, and really, what I want to tell you about is the is the very first theorem, and uh, and I'll sort of, we'll see how far how far we get with that. But I want to sort of at least tell you the so the, the interesting ideas that uh, we'll go into. Okay, so so we do this in three steps. Uh, those are the three papers, really. Um, and the first step is we uh, we start from this primitive called conditional disclosure of secrets, which I'll define in the very next slide, um, or maybe in two slides. Um, and that we show, we, we sort of observe a connection between conditional disclosure of secrets and sort of act, uh, secret sharing for a certain class of access structures called graph access structures or forbidden graph access structures. This was known before, uh, sort of well known within the community. Um, and what we show is a, is a new CDS protocol with communication complexity two to the square root n. And that sort of gives you uh, uh, a new sort of secret sharing scheme for these graph access structures. So it's not all access structures, it's, it's a class of things, but you know, it's a, it's a new thing. Um, the second work sort of generalized this not to graphs, but to hypergraphs. Um, and, uh, and again, we don't loosen the communication complexity at all. We show sort of a, instead of a two party CDS, which I'll define again in a, in a little bit, we show an n party CDS. We don't lose anything in the communication, um, more or less. Uh, stood to the root end stuff, and and the the, the new technique uh, for, for the new technique in the CDS construction is the connection to private information retrieval. The new technique here is something called matching vector families. Again, I'll tell you much more about it down the line. And the final work actually lifts all this into not secret sharing for classes of access structure, but really secret sharing for all access structures. And that's where we hit the two to the point nine nine four, and uh, you know you really you know should be in suspense at this point. Like, why? What is this point nine nine four coming from? I'll, I'll I'll reveal it towards the end. I promise. Um, and there again, there is a sort of a new technique uh, which which has nothing to do with secret sharing. It's really sort of like a circuit construction technique, um, and that's that's what. Okay, so these are the three steps, and really I want to sort of focus on the first step. That's what I'll talk for the most of the time. I'll talk about it. And then um, we'll see sort of how far I get with the other. Okay, so so so, you know, I kept talking about conditional disclosure of secrets, CDS, again and again and again. So what is this? What is this object? Okay, so here is what CDS is. It's a very very nice communication game um, uh, that was defined by Gartner, Ishai, Kushilevitz, and Malkin back in the last century, right? Um, and what it is, is the following. It's a game between uh, three players. There's Alice on the left, my left, uh, Bob on the right, and there's a Charlie. Alice knows an input X in some interval capital N, right? Uh, you should really think about it as a little n bit string. So two to the little n is capital N for me, okay? Um, and Bob knows an input Y also in the same uh, sort of interval. And both of them know a bit B, single bit B. Their goal, is to send a single message to Charlie who knows both X and Y. So the only thing he doesn't know is the bit P. And they wanna make sure that Charlie gets this bit P if and only if some function F of X comma Y equals one. So F is a publicly known function or a predicate. And if F of X, Y happens to be one, Charlie should get the bit P, should be able to recover the bit P from the two messages, N, A, N, and B. And if F of X, Y is zero, he should get no information about B at all from, this, uh, from these two messages. So that's what they want. And to help uh, Alice and Bob out, they, they share a random string R in the, you know, not quite in the sky. They both know R, but Charlie doesn't know it. Okay, so that's like the secret sort of random, uh, the secret common randomness. So if you think about it, this is actually quite not trivial. So Alice would like to sort of sometimes send the bit B to Bob, sometimes send the bit B to Charlie, sometimes not, but she doesn't know when Charlie should get this bit. That depends on why that she doesn't know, only Bob knows. In fact, she is not allowed to talk to Bob. So, so how in the world is this supposed to happen? Right? So that's a non-triviality. Um, so, you know, okay, so this sounds like a game. If you sort of peer into it, you see similarities with secret sharing, right? Somebody should get the bit sometimes, but not other times, yada, yada, yada. But you don't, but what does this have to do with secret sharing? What's the actual connection? So here's a sort of a hint of the connection. Um, and so we'll build on it uh, 
later in the talk. So I claim that if you have a CDS scheme for a function f, or really let's say for all functions f, then there is a secret sharing scheme for a family of access structures called graph access structures. Okay, so what is a graph access structure? In a graph access structure, rather graph secret sharing scheme, there are uh, two times n parties, right? So the, the purple parties on the left and the green parties on the right, there are two times capital N. And remember, capital N was actually the domain size of Alice and the domain size of Bob, right? So that's the capital N. Um, and those, these are the parties. So now I have to define what is the access structure? When can the parties reconstruct the secret? So it turns out that no single party should be able to reconstruct a secret. So that's out of the way. Let's get, the, get that out of the way. Any set of three parties should be able to reconstruct the secret. Any set of three parties should, no one, sh no one can. So the interesting stuff happens in, in this, in between, between sets of two parties, right? So, so now given a party, given a, sort of a, a party X and a party Y, when should they be able to reconstruct the secret? Well, if and only if there's actually an edge in this graph. Okay. So again, the secret sharing is defined by a graph, a bipartite graph of this form. And it says that the left party and the right party should be able to reconstruct only if they are joined by an edge in this graph. That's, it. Right? That's a graph access structure. It's really what, what's also called a forbidden graph. So to be technically correct, I should have called it a forbidden graph access structure, but okay, fine, but that's Okay, so, so really there's a correspondence between sort of this access structure and functions. So, you know, um, you know uh, so you should think about the edge X comma Y being in the access structure, if and only if so the, the adjacency function uh, evaluates to one on X comma Y, right? So this is the correspondence that we talked about. Okay, so this is the graph. Factor. So now I claim that if you have a CDS scheme, you immediately get a secret sharing scheme for graph access structures. The question is how? Here it is. Um, in a secret sharing scheme, again, there's a dealer, right, who has a bit B and he has to do something to generate shares. How many shares? Two times capital and shares, give it to each party on the left and the right. That's what he wants. Okay, so what does party X on the left get and party Y on the right get? So here's what uh, the dealer does. He computes, he samples a random string R, right? He has this bit B and he computes all possible Alice messages and all possible Xs, and he computes all possible Bob messages and all possible Ys, okay? And he gives the corresponding messages to the parties on the left and the right. Yeah, that's that. Yes, that's it. So now why is this good? Because, you know, uh, you know imagine two parties coming together from the left and the right, right? The parties X and Y, uh, party X has the Alice message on X, party Y has the Bob message on Y, and you know, CDS tells you that they can reconstruct only if the function F, X, Y outputs one, and the function F is really the adjacency function, so it exactly corresponds to, uh, to, uh, to graph secret sharing. Okay. So you know, some of you at least might be wondering, oh, what about two parties coming from the same side, et cetera, et cetera, but these all turn out actually to be completely trivial and they can be handled and I don't wanna, so it's, a, it's an exercise. Offline, okay, don't think about it now. Okay, so that's CDS and secret sharing. So, so clearly there's a strong connection between sort of CDS and, uh, and secret sharing. Okay, and, and, and you know, looking down the line, what we wanna do is we don't want this forbidden graph, we don't want graphs, we don't want nothing. We actually want like secret sharing for all possible access structures. So that's the, that's the, that's going to be our goal. Okay, so, so that's what we'll, 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 we'll do. Um, and let me actually make uh, the problem harder for myself. Okay, isn't that fun? Uh, you know, so I'm not going to sort of uh, think about sort of, uh, you, you know, uh, 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 Alice having an n bit, little n bit input and Bob having a little bit, little n bit input. Alice actually has an entire truth table, right? So that's called a database D, which is the same as a truth table for an n bit, little n bit function. Um, uh, and Bob, same thing as before, right? He's, he has an input to this function. Okay. This is harder than before because, because you, know, you know, any protocol that solves this can actually solve the setting where Alice has a single bit. So she writes down the truth table for the residual function and then you, 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 you're you good. Okay, so this is actually the harder problem. Yeah. Good. Um, so again, so now the goal is that uh, Charlie, there's no 
public function, rather Charlie should be able to, uh, well, Charlie knows both the truth table D and the input X, and he should be able to recover uh, the bit B only if uh, you know, D of X is one. In other words, the truth table is, says one on this input. Okay, so this is super important that uh, that we actually uh, that we actually understand uh, this uh, this primitive. So let's uh, let me ask if uh, if uh, you know, let me pause for fifteen seconds uh, and see if there are any questions. All good. Okay, I'll, I will do fifteen seconds. All right, good. Let me keep going. Okay. All right. So that's what that's what it is. And now we could ask, look, what what do we know for CDS? Like, what kind of protocols do we know? Um, uh, it's not completely. Well, actually, it's an it's an exercise to construct sort of a, you know like a, some protocol that, uh, that that solves CDS regardless of the communication complexity. And I'll actually tell you one of the solutions today, and I recommend that you go back and try to figure out the rest of the solutions by yourself. Okay, so the, the upper bound, the best upper bound uh, is uh, two to the n over two. All right, so again, two to the n is the size of the truth table. So two to the n over two communication, you can actually figure things out. You can actually do this, pro this, this, this solve this problem. The best lower bound is omega n. So again, you, know, you see this sort of exponential gap sort of phenomenon happening. And both are sort of, uh, I think, um, the lower bound is the work of uh, Gay, Karenides, and we, and the upper bound, also that work, um, I think. Yeah. Okay, so, so you know, this is all very mysterious. So let's actually do, let's actually do a protocol. Okay, so let's actually, let me actually tell you how a protocol works. Uh, so yeah, this is the problem. CDS, you have, uh, Alice has an n bit, uh, two to the capital N, two to the little n bit database, Bob has, uh, and so on. Okay, so what does Alice, what can Alice uh, send? Um, here is a protocol, Alice actually, thinks about the random string, the, the shared random string with uh, the common random string with Bob as a sequence of capital N bits, R1 up to R capital N. And uh, she just picks out those bits that correspond to the one entries in the database, right? Just picks out those bits and uses that as a one-time pad for the, so the bit B that she wants to communicate, okay? So she encrypts the bit B using a subset of the little r's, which ones? Well, the ones for which the database entries are one. And what does Bob send? Bob just looks, Bob has an index x. He says, you know, go, let me look up this capital R for the right bit, r sub x, and send it over to Charlie. Okay, that's that. So you see what's going on, right? If the database on index x evaluates to one, or rather the database entry on index x is one, then Charlie has both R sub X and he also has R sub X XORed with B and then he gets B. And if D sub X is zero, then he, he just does not have, uh, you know, R sub X XOR B at all. And then he has no information about B at all. Okay. Um, so this is a protocol where, what is the communication complexity? Alice sends two to the N, two to the little N bits in the worst case, right? And Bob sends one bit, a single bit. Um, it turns out it's a little bit less trivial um, to show a protocol that has opposite guarantees where Alice sends one bit and Bob sends two to the little n bits. It turns out, as, uh, as I think Hotek and friends showed, that you can actually do a balancing trick between the two. You can actually get, make both of them work hard. Uh, and in fact, both of them send like two to the n over two bits. Okay, so that's the state of, uh, that's the state of, state of the art. And you know, a curious feature of all these protocols is that they all have linear reconstruction. In other words, Charlie has a linear function that depends on D and X, his input, that he applies to the Alice and Bob messages. So it's a linear function on the Alice and Bob messages that lets him reconstruct, that outputs the bit B. Okay, so that, uh, that's the feature of these, uh, these constructions. In fact, uh, um, uh, Hotek uh, and, and, and Franz showed that for any protocol, any CDS protocol with linear reconstruction, the size of the Alice message times the size of the Bob message has to be two to the n. In other words, they actually constructed an optimal protocol, right? I mean, if you stick with linear reconstruction, 
there is nothing you can do or say yes. Okay, so that's what they showed. Um, so, you know, our line of thought is uh, we want to do secret sharing. And to do that, we want to construct a better CVS protocol. And here you go, you cannot reconstruct a better CVS protocol if you stick with linear reconstruction. So what do you do? You do, some, you do non-linear. You sort of try to sort of go to non-linear reconstruction protocols. That's precisely what uh, we do. Okay, so here's our theorem. There is a CVS protocol with total communication two to the square root n bits, as, uh, as I said before. Um, in fact, we show not just a single CDS protocol, we show a transformation from two server private information retrieval protocols, information theoretic private information retrieval protocols, uh, into a CDS protocol. And we can't start with any peer protocol, PIR protocol. Uh, we have to start with a nice enough PIR protocol. But it turns out that all known peer protocols, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, are nice enough. So it, uh, you know, like we can take all of them and put it through our compiler and get new CDS protocols. Okay, so that's what I'm going to show. That's actually, you know, I have about half an hour and that's what I'm going to sort of really focus on. Okay, so, so um, you know, uh, so I said we start with the PIR and construct CDS and therefore secret sharing and so forth. But where does this all come from? Like, wh why did we go to peer schemes to begin with? Right? So, you know, the, the, the high level sort of picture is, you know, what, what we are trying to do is solve the sort of the communication versus computation trade-off. We want to make communication independent of the computational cost, or at the very least, strictly smaller than the computational cost. And you start asking, has this been done before? Like, you know, like, can we stand on the shoulders of giants? You know, like, has, has this problem been looked at and solved before? Indeed, the answer is yes. Uh, in the computational setting, where you have computational security, so maybe I should just kind of like briefly mention this because this is IT crypto conference. You know, FHE, homomorphic encryption, and the new kid on the block called function secret sharing, actually do give us low communication and PC protocols. So the communication is independent of the computation, is smaller than the computation size, right? So that is, that we know how to do, but we're not in the computational setting, we're in the information theoretic setting. And there again, we know sort of solutions to this problem. In fact, private information retrieval can be thought of as a way to sort of do multi-party computation. In fact, that was made precise in a work of uh, Eyal and Yuval back in 2004, it was a beautiful paper. Um, so you can solve private information retrieval with communication complexity less than the database or the truth table size. In other words, less than the computational representation of a, of a, of the, of a function time. Okay, so this we know, this we actually know. So that's actually a very good thing to start with. In fact, even better is the work of Amos, Yuval, Ranjit, and Eyal that showed how to take any super duper nice peer protocol um, and turn it into what's called a PSM protocol, which is closely related to, but stronger than CDS. And, you know, that's actually nice too. So we, we are actually getting, this is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Okay, so, uh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, in, in, uh, in their work, they needed this super duper nice protocol and not many protocols are super duper nice. In fact, the best known peer protocols are not super duper nice. Okay, so we can't, you know, so there's a little bit of a, sort of a, yeah. Um, Super duper is too, too nice. And we don't want to be too nice, we just want to be nice enough uh, and, and get things done. Okay, so all these uh, give you indication that, you know, peer really is the right thing to look at. You know, there is something going on there and we should be looking at it. Okay, in fact, let's look at it. So what is private information retrieval? Let me sort of define it at the, uh, you know, after all the suspense actually define it. Uh, so here again, there is an Alex and a Bob. Uh, and the Alice and the Bob, they both have the same database, right? So that's not the case for CDS. They have the same database D. Charlie has an index X. And he sends, uh, he wants to sort of actually get the X index of the database, X element in the database, uh, without actually letting, without actually telling X to either Alice or to Bob. Uh, so what he does is he sends um, uh, a query Q0 to, Al to, to Bob and Q1 to Alice and gets sort of an answer. And from this, he can reconstruct uh, D of X, uh, but this protocol shouldn't reveal any information. Neither Alice nor Bob alone can learn any information about the index X. Okay, so this is what uh, PIR is, and this is an amazing primitive, uh, worth knowing, okay. 
The best known two server peer uh, recent work um, still stands, has communication complexity two to the square root n. That was after a long sort of line of work, um, long line of work. So, so you start thinking, you know, so, so don't look at the bottom half of the slide, just look at the top half for the moment. You know, from the 50,000 feet view, you know, they, they're both the same, right? I mean, you know, there's an Alice, there's a Bob, there's a Charlie, and there are sort of things coming sort of one way. There's a little bit going in the other way in here, but whatever. Okay, so they look very similar, right? But, you know, you come down to like 10,000 feet, and that stops looking similar at all. In fact, in peer, you want to hide the index, which is in little and bit string. And CDS, you only want to hide a single bit. So that actually seems easier. In peer, you don't have common randomness between Alice and Bob, uh, because I suppose they're not trying to hide anything from Charlie. So you know, why do you need it? And in, in CDS, you have a common random string R. Actually, it should also make life easier. Uh, in peer, you, the databases are replicated two ways. And there is no replication in, uh, in, uh, in CDS. In fact, it's more like a number on the forehead type situation going on in CDS, right? So they look, you know, 10,000 feet, they start looking completely different from, uh, from each other, okay? So you start thinking, start questioning your sanity. So, you know, am I really going nuts trying to connect the two? Uh, but then you look again and say, well, you know, there is smoke and there, there is smoke, there must be fire, right? What is the smoke? The best uh, lower bound for peer is omega n, and the best upper bound is two to the root n. You know, in CDS, the best lower bound is omega n, and the best upper bound for for a while the constructions looked a lot similar to the peer constructions. So then you say, okay, you know what? Uh, you start wondering. Okay, start chasing the fire, chasing the smoke, hoping to find fire. Okay, all right. So that's what we do. Okay, so so that, that's da, 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 I set up a whole bunch of uh, sort of uh, suspense. Um, let me actually jump into the construction. In fact, the construction will be one slide. Okay. In fact, there will be very little math and there will be pictures on the, on the slide. So here's the construction. You start from a peer protocol, you want to construct a CDS. That's the goal. Right? A peer, there are queries, there are answers. So in fact, this is a two round, two message peer, but okay, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what we want. All right. So how do we start? First, I'm going to split Charlie into two Charlies. Okay, there's a query generating Charlie, and then there's a reconstructing Charlie. They both share this randomness, so they, you know, they, 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 they can sort of, they, they, they know the same sort of thing. Um, yeah, so that's sort of a syntactical thing. And now um, I want to look at uh, Charlie, the two queries that he sends, Q0 and Q1, right? And I say, you know, Q0 and Q1 together should contain information about X, should actually completely determine X. And yet, neither Q0 nor Q1 has any information about X. So what does that start smelling of? That smells like a secret sharing of X. In fact, it doesn't have to be X. In fact, uh, Charlie can pre-process X into some longer string called U, right? Which has all the information about X. And then he, he takes this and secret shares it into Q0 and Q1. So that's what it looks like, right? Okay, they call it that. So R is a random string. R plus U sub X, they together form a secret sharing of U sub X. Okay, so that's so far syntactical. And now, again, this is syntactical. What, does it, what do the databases do? They apply a function on the incoming queries, right? The left database applies this function called H sub D. H is a function that depends on the database. You apply it to R, you generate an answer. So nothing, this is really like a notational kind of thing. Also, the right guy, he applies HD to the incoming query, which is R plus U sub X. Okay, so, so far, so good. All right. And now comes the sort of the nice peer part of, uh, part of things. What I want is that the reconstructor, the, the Charlie, the half Charlie in the bottom, should be able to apply a linear function on the two answers, namely HD of R and HD of R plus U X, and reconstruct the database D. The, the database entry, namely T sub X. Okay, so that's what I want. I wrote down on the top right a particular form of this linear function, but it turns out that doesn't matter. You can, any linear function can actually be uh, written down in this way. Okay, so again, let me reiterate. There is a linear function that depends on Charlie's input X that when you apply to the two messages, incoming messages, should give you the database entry. That's what it is. Okay, and we'll call this, uh, we'll give it a name, we'll call this, uh, 
a linear client PIR state. Okay, that's 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 a property. So 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 far all sort of generic except this property which uh, which we will. All right. So okay, fine. So now what? Okay, so I want to go to CDS. Okay, so what what happens in CDS? There is an Alice, there is a Bob, and then there's a Charlie, right? So who is Alice? Who is Bob? Who is Charlie? Well, Alice actually knows the database. Yes. So it makes sense that uh, this guy, the, the left database is, uh, is Alice. Okay, so that's, that's good. Bob knows, uh, well, the other way around. Bob knows that, yeah, it uh, mixed Alice and Bob. Bob uh, is the left database. Alice is, knows the input X, and therefore she is uh, one half of the top half of Charlie. Okay, I'm just pattern matching at this point, okay? Um, and you know, all makes sense, right? Uh, Alice uh, knows her input X and generates a message, it sends it out somewhere. Bob knows the database, it generates a bit, it generates a message, sends it out somewhere. They also need a common random string, but here it seems like Alice is actually sending a message to Bob, which is not permitted in CDS at all, right? There's no message between Alice and Bob. But this message is a random string. So what, there's no message, it's really a common shared randomness, that's it. So now we're getting closer and closer. Yeah, it's looking warmer and warmer, right? Okay, so now all good. Who's Charlie? Charlie is really, ah, okay, so let's just, just go back. Huh? So Alice actually holds uh, an input X and a bit B, right? So because Charlie actually, at the end of the day, the CDS Charlie knows both the database and the input. The only thing he doesn't know is bit, and there is no bit here. Where is a bit? So here's what we are going to do. Alice, does one of two things depending on her bit B. She either sends the, uh, the, the peer message R plus UX if the bit B is zero, or she, uh, if the bit B is one, sorry, or she just sends the randomness R if the bit B is zero. So in other words, she sends R plus B times U sub X. So either plus U sub X or not, depending on the bit B. Okay, that's what she does. That's how she incorporates the bit B into her message. Now let's rewrite the equation on the top right and say, well, you know what? What's being sent out is not R plus U sub X, but really it's R plus B times U sub X, okay? So what happens here? If B is zero, right, then this equation is actually zero, identically zero, right? Because on the left, you have HD of R plus zero, which is HD of R minus HD of R, zero, right? Yeah? That makes sense. If B is one, then uh, it is actually D sub X. So concisely, if you write, try to write it down, as a function, the right-hand side, when you evaluate it, it's B times D sub X. So in other words, if D sub X is one, it's B. If D sub X is zero, it's a zero always, right? Yeah, that's good. So again, warmer, even warmer. Okay, so now I'm going to do the best work on my uh, slides, which is this animation. Um, you know, so now I say, okay, you know what? Now I have my Charlie. Now I have my Charlie. Who is the Charlie? The Charlie is uh, one half of the database. Remember? Yeah, let's do it again. Okay. <laughs> Why not? So one half of the database, the right half of the database, together with the bottom half of the peer Charlie is my CDS Charlie. Okay. Does this make sense? How does this make sense? Charlie gets these two messages from Alice and Bob right? What does he need to do? He needs to compute that equation on the top uh, right, okay? So he computes HD on the Alice message, which he can because he knows D. He uh, knows HD of R from Bob directly, and he knows U sub X because he knows X. He can compute U sub X. Okay, so he really uses knowledge of both D and X. He computes this equation, and he gets what, uh, he, gets what he wants. He gets B times D sub X. It's exactly what he's supposed to get. D sub X is one, he gets B, otherwise he gets zero. Okay, that's it. That's the CDS protocol. Well, that's if you only care about correctness. Okay, now you have to actually, I have to actually prove that this is private as well in the sense that if D sub X is zero, Charlie does not get, these two messages don't give Charlie any information about B. That's what I want. That's the one other thing I want to prove, right? Why is that the case? Well, look at the Alice message, okay? So what is Alice message? It's B times something. So it has some information about B, but one time padded with R, right? You add R to it. What is R? R is a truly random string. So Alice message by itself is completely random. 
right? Bob's message, on the other hand, actually reveals some information about this randomness. So, so you know, I have a one-time pad, but I do have one-time pad encrypted B, but I have some information about the pad. So not clear, right? Not clear anymore, not clear at all. So it's correct, but not private. But it turns out that this is actually not that hard to fix. And again, we to fix this, we go back to the linearity of this uh, of this uh, of this scheme. Um, um, uh, we uh, we we can sort of you know do the one time pad trick once again, uh, adding more randomness to the to the common random string. You know this offending message from Bob. That's the one that reveals information about R. You one time pad it as well. And then, then nothing reveals any information at this point, right? But then correctness goes down the drain. But you know, all you need for correctness is actually some little bit of information, which is the new one-time pad in a product with use of X. And that really, I'm using the linearity of the scheme to achieve that. So it turns out that you know, put together this sort of non-privacy issue is pretty easy to handle. And using the fact that uh, reconstruction is a, is a linear, linear. Okay, so that's the scheme. At this point, I claim you have a correct and private CDS scheme starting from any linear client PIR scheme. The one thing, uh, let me say one more thing and then I'll actually pause for, for questions. Um, the one thing I wanna say is, you know, um, um, well, actually two things. One, the communication complexity is more or less exactly the communication complexity of the, of the peer scheme, which is two to the root n. There's a little bit in addition, but that's sort of negligible compared to two to the root n. Um, so we, um, we got a CDS scheme, right? Starting from a linear client PIR scheme, right? So, you know, we, you know, the question is, did we get a linear Charlie, linear client CDS scheme as a result. And if we did that, there must be something seriously wrong because Hotek and friends proved that you can't do better than two to the n over two communication for linear client CDS. So what exactly is going on? One could sort of look deeper into it. The point is that the CDS Charlie is actually not linear. The CDS Charlie, if you do the animation once again, is an amalgamation of the peer Charlie, which is linear, and the peer database, which is highly nonlinear. Okay, so that's how we sort of used, even though the peer scheme is linear client, we can still use it to get a non-linear CDS uh, scheme. Okay, so that's what the scheme is. Let me, um, okay, actually, let me say one more thing. The instantiation, I'm not going to say too much about it. Uh, there is the, uh, is a beautiful work on peer that in, in turn sort of goes into uh, amazing mathematics that comes from matching vector families. Uh, and that actually is what lets us instantiate a linear client uh, PIR scheme with this good communication complexity. Once you put this together, you get a CDS scheme. So let me kind of go back to the, to the, to the previous slide. Let me pause for 30 seconds. Okay. Let me take we a know, couple of questions maybe. We know the, there's a question from Yale. It was answered. Oh, yeah, I got it. It was my mistake. No, I, I think it's asked it for the entire audience. I yes. It's a good idea. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You want to ask? Sorry. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. I was just confused about what you learn is actually D sub X, and I was confused about, you know, you want to learn B, not D sub X. But it was my bad. You actually learned B times D right. sub X, which is exactly what you want to learn. So you. we're good. Uh, but you know, can I ask you one one question, which yes. is. Uh, so is the scheme, the peer scheme, you went through it really quickly just now, but is the peer scheme of, uh, of Dvir et tal, uh, it, it is the one that has the property, the linear property that you want, and therefore you can kind of yeah. convert it here. Is that what you said, right? That's correct, that's correct, that's correct. In fact, all the peer schemes starting from, you know, the work of uh, Eyal and, you know, Shor, Goldreich, Kushlevit, Sudan, they all seem to be linear flight to my knowledge. Yeah. We know that I have a counter example. <laughs> and I have a scheme where the reconstruction depends on the randomness. Interesting. So which scheme is it? With who again? It's uh, something that depends on the uh, polynomial reconstruction. Uh, uh -huh. Polynomial. So you uh -huh. have a randomness uh, to reconstruct a sequence and the randomness is part of the 
שאתה מאוד מאוד תוצאה ל... It won't give anything more important, but you cannot, it's not nice according to your definition. Great. Sounds good. Sounds good. I'll ask you offline and I'd like to know more. Um, okay, good. So uh, many, uh, most, uh, you know, uh, peer schemes are, are, are nice. Okay, so, so let me keep going. Um, I think there's another question in the chat, I believe. Yeah, go for it. So in the, uh, in the period to CDS transformation, how does Bob know how many bits of random tape to use? How does Bob know how many bits? So the, the, uh, the number of random bits is, number of, uh, the length of the random tape is predetermined. Um, um, that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's a short answer. It's predetermined. It's like two to the n plus like the length of R is two to the n, it's two to the n random bits. R prime is, uh, is whatever it is, length of HD of R, which is again predetermined. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Can I, uh, I'll, I'll uh, keep going. Um, okay. Um, all right, so, so we constructed a CBS, so that was really the step one. That's really the, you know, uh, much of uh, sort of uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Let me briefly say how I do steps two and three. Um, step two. Um, so CDS, as we saw, gives you a secret sharing scheme for graph axis structures. Um, um, and uh, what you, the first sort of generalization that, uh, that, we, that we do is instead of, sort of, again, you have two groups of parties, right? And um, uh, interesting sort of uh, authorized subsets come from sort of, you know, taking one party from the left and one party from the right, right? They're pairs of parties. Of course, I could generalize this to not two groups of n over two each, but n over two groups of two parties each. Then the authorized subsets will look at sort of one party from each pair of parties, right? So they will be sort of n over two uh, size sets that are constructed by taking one out of each pair, right? So this is, the, as you can define it as a hypergraph if you would like. And that sort of dramatically expands the number of access functions as you would expect. And now you have two to the two to the n over two access functions that you can sort of write it this way. Um, the question is, you know, I want to do to graph secret sharing using CDS. I want to do to hypergraph secret sharing what I did to graph secret sharing. And I want a generalization of CDS that, uh, that does the right job. And that turns out is a multi-party CDS. So what is a multi-party CDS? Again, Two-party CDS, there's an Alice and a Bob. Bob actually holds the entire index X, the entire database index X. What I want to do is I want to split Bob, let's say into two parties uh, where, uh, you know, the left Bob has one half of the index and the right Bob has the other half of the index. But in fact, I could do this, I could really completely decompose Bob. I could have N Bobs, but each Bob has one bit of the index and that's what I, that's the setting, right? So there is one Alice who holds the database there are N Bobs who hold one bit each of the index and they wanna do the same thing as, as before. Okay, and we show that again, you can construct a multi-party CDS protocol with it with communication complexity two to the root n bit. So going from CDS, the two party to the multi-party did not cost us uh, anything at all. There's a little sort of, uh, sort of cost in the, in the exponent, uh, logarithmic cost in the exponent, but never mind. essentially it costs nothing at all. Uh, and again, for the linear reconstruction case, uh, we construct a multi-party CDS protocol with uh, total communication two to the n over two bits, and that actually turns out to be optimal. This was also observed by Amos and uh, Nati uh, concurrently. Okay, and the corollary do the same trick, uh, so going from CDS to sec graph secret sharing to the hypergraphs, you get a forbidden hypergraph secret sharing with the same parameters. Okay, so, so, so let me say one word, uh, one sort of slide about how we go from two-party to multi-party CDS. And, you know, we want to lift, again, a two-party CDS into n-party CDS. And a natural idea to do this is to do what's called player emulation. In other words, the n parties, n bobs, emulates what the one bob did in the, in the two CDS. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's what we want to do. But that seems like actually like a chicken and egg problem because I'm actually asking all these n bobs to do a potentially complex computation, uh, but that's sort of harder than the problem that we were going to solve to begin with. So it seems like there's a chicken and egg issue here. The way we solve it is to observe that bobs computation 
in the two CDS scheme, which again comes from the Dvir Gopi protocol, which again comes from the Grolmush sort of matching vector uh, methodology, matching vector construction, is actually pretty simple. So we look black, non black box into our two CDS and therefore going down all the way to matching vector. We say Bob's computational complexity in the two CDS is pretty small. In fact, it can be written down as a branching program, small branching program. And therefore, you can use sort of standard sort of tricks uh, to, to, uh, to do this uh, player emulation. Um, and uh, and that's, what, uh, that's what we do. Uh, what I said is not completely correct. If you go all the way down to Grolmush, you don't actually get such uh, simple matching vectors. You actually have to change Grolmush a little bit. So it's really very highly non-black box uh, to, uh, to, get, uh, to get this result. Okay, so that's how we do is one brief sort of slide on how we get multi-party. If you remember nothing from it, just remember you do player emulation, which is sort of what you want to do, emulate um, sort of the one bob with n bobs. And, uh, and we can do a good job of it if the computational complexity of bob is small. And that's what we sort of, that, that's, we make that happen. That's what we do. Okay, so that's the multi-party CDS. And finally, step three is going all the way to secret sharing schemes for arbitrary access structures. Um, and, uh, and I'll say even more, I'll be even more brief. I'll be just as brief about it. Um, so, uh, so it turns out that the first step is actually uh, pretty simple. Um, you know, forbidden hypergraphs actually look at uh, certain subsets of N over two parties. In fact, you divide parties into pairs and say, you know, I'm gonna pick one from each pair. That's the, so the set of access structures that you support. Uh, and you can slightly generalize it to access structures, slice function access structures which says that um, any set of more than n over two parties is authorized, right? Any set of less than n over two parties is unauthorized. And really in the middle for n over two parties, you can do whatever you want. It could be completely arbitrary. That's called a slice function. Uh, and that's sort of an even larger class of uh, access structures than uh, forbidden hypergraphs. In fact, there's two to the, right? I mean, in the middle, there are um, n over two parties, uh, right? Uh, and uh, if you sort of compute the number of access functions, it's really two to the um, n choose n over two. Um, so it turns out that there's a way to turn generically forbidden hypergraph secret sharing into slice function secret sharing uh, and uh, uh, the preserving communication complexity. So, so far all we did actually stuck with the two to the square root n communication complexity, which is really what we want to get in, in some sense. Um, it's the last step that goes from slice functions to general functions that completely ruins this, uh, this very nice story. And that's where we go from two to the square root 10 to two to the 0.994. Okay. So I'll say one word about where the 0.994 comes in. Uh, and here's what, uh, what happens. So what I want to do for general uh, uh, access structures, I want to take an arbitrary monotone function. I want to write it as a combination of what I know how to do, right? And what do I know how to do? I know how to do slice functions. And I know how to handle sort of small enough access structures in the sense access structures that have few sets. Um, and uh, in fact, what we end up doing is uh, uh, we split an arbitrary monotone function into sort of a, 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 mono, a slice function and, uh, and uh, monotone functions that are only non-trivial on sets of size more than n over two, I call this f, f talk. And uh, another function which is only non-trivial on uh, sets of size less than n over two, we call f plot. So it turns out there's, there's actually a precise way to define these things and there's a way to write uh, an arbitrary monotone function in this as a combination. Uh, and more, more than that, you can actually use secret sharing schemes for these three access structures put together to construct a secret sharing scheme for F itself um, with the complexity being the sum of the complexities of these things. Um, the unfortunate sort of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, wrinkle in this, uh, in, this, in this idea is that uh, F bot and F top uh, are actually pretty large. So fbot really, for example, handles all sets of size less than n over two, of which there are a lot of them, right? The, the number of sets of size uh, n over two is two to the n over square root n, and the number of sets outside is two to the n times one minus one over square root n, which is quite large. So you cannot do something trivial for those things and get away with it. Again, even more briefly, the way we solve it is, uh, is we extend sort of slice function secret sharing sort of, to sort of secret sharing schemes for thicker slices. So you should think about slice function as a slice of width one. You can extend it to sort of width sort of delta n or two, two times delta n in this, in this picture. 
And again, the same sort of methodology goes through. And now you have a trade-off. The larger the delta, the costlier the thick slice, the thicker the slice, and therefore the costlier the thick slice secret sharing. But the rest of it is smaller sets and therefore the cheaper, the trivial, the F-bot and F-top secret sharing. So now you can sort of play balancing games and we get sort of 0.994 by playing this balancing game. Um, Amos and Benny and others uh, improved this to 0.8 something um, by playing uh, the balancing game more cleverly in a recursive way. Um, um, and uh, the recent work of uh, um, Amos and Benny and others again, um, um, you know, depart from this methodology and consider a more general form of CDS called robust CDS. That again sort of gives them uh, an advantage in this constant. Okay, so, so, so summary, uh, what we had was uh, secret sharing schemes of this nature. Um, and uh, one thing I do wanna say is, um, is, is that uh, the corollary of our linear secret sharing scheme, which shares size two to the point nine 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 n is, is a purely computational corollary. So, you know, uh, um, uh, Karshmer and Wigdesson showed a tight connection between computational complexity of linear secret sharing schemes and the, the size of monotone span programs that compute functions. And, you know, as a corollary for a secret sharing scheme, we show that every function, every monotone function has a monotone span program of size two to the 0.999 times n. So it's a purely computational, it doesn't talk about communication complexity at all. It's a purely computational corollary that we get out of this uh, sort of, you know, bounding the communication complexity. Um, okay, so, so I'll also sort of finish with that. I'll take uh, two more minutes. Um, so the picture is, uh, the new picture is this with, the, with all the new works that uh, build on top of, uh, for, of our work. Um, uh, for unrestricted secret sharing, lower bound hasn't improved from the 90s. The upper bound is now two to the 0.637n. Uh, linear secret sharing, two to the n over two is the counting lower bound and, uh, and uh, the upper bound is two to the 0.762n. So open problem, this sort of immediately suggests an open problem. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I believe uh, uh, Amos' uh, conjecture uh, is that for general secret sharing schemes, um, you need the shares of size two to the omega n. In other words, log s over n is omega one, is uh, Amos' sort of longstanding conjecture and uh, is a great problem to prove uh, Amos wrong. Um, I don't believe there is any money on it, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, but uh, there's prestige on it. <laughs> okay, so that's the first open problem. If you, if, you are, if, you, if you want an easier open problem, here is one. Um, you know, um, so we said, you know, linear secret sharing schemes can only do so well. They can only do two to the n over two. And at this point, current state of the art, you know, doesn't tell us that non-linear secret sharing schemes can do better than every conceivable linear secret sharing schemes. We can't conclude that because, you know, the complexity is more than two to the n over two for the unrestricted secret sharing. So that's the question. Can non-linearity provably buy us more? That's the question of showing that uh, the shared complexity is less than two to the n over two. That's again, a fantastic open question. It's easier than actually proving our most wrong, uh, but, but it's a, it's a so it's a, great, uh, it's a great open question. If you really want to go all the way, you want to really close the uh, 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 upper and lower uh, bounds for general secret sharing schemes. And there I would conjecture an upper bound of polynomial n. Um, I'm mindful of the fact that this is being recorded. Nevertheless, I'll say it. Um, let me step even further back. So this sort of work fits into uh, the general theme of sort of computation versus communication cost and various problems related to secure computation. There's lots of uh, very interesting work on it. CDS, um, PIR, secret sharing we saw. Private simultaneous messages is yet another problem, which is very interesting, MPC. And there are all sorts of sort of connections that are being formed right now uh, between these, uh, these primitives. Some sort of Solid arrows would say, you know, anything of this nature gives you that. Dotted arrows that say anything of this nature with some properties, niceness or super duper niceness gives you something else. So it's, I think there's a lot more to be, to be discovered here. And, uh, and um, I think it would shed new light on sort of really foundational problems, not just in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in cryptography, but also in sort of coding theory and uh, sort of other fields. Um, 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 and uh, yeah, so that's uh, lots to do here. Thank you very much.
Thanks, we not for lovely uh, talk. Uh, I don't see any questions. Uh, Adam, you had some comment? Oh, not not an important one. Just what Vinod described as an easier problem could be harder. Uh, um, namely, uh, you know, if the actual lower bound is two to the n over two for uh, <laughs> right, right, right for general secret sharing scheme, then uh, you know proving Amos wrong would only require like you know, you know or, right. No, no, proving Amos right is uh, That's right. Proving Amos right might be considerably easier than yeah, proving yeah. lower bound of Absolutely. the form. Actually, well, what can I say? I mean, uh, I'm a, I'm an upper bounds guy. <laughs> You're right. So I think uh, we know another interesting question is uh, to design a better private simultaneous messages, uh, basically uh, yes. taking all these improvement to PSM protocols. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's, uh, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I guess, uh, you know, now that I'm on it, uh, maybe another, another question is, uh, um, um, another question is the following, right? Uh, so, so, so far we've been talking about sort of general secret sharing schemes. Like we want to capture all access structures, blah, 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 right? Uh, or, uh, you know, large, very large class of most access structures, et cetera, et cetera. What about, you know, can we, can we turn the results we prove in these high regimes and go down to earth and show better access structures for the better secret sharing schemes for concrete access structures? I think that's a great sort of open question. And, uh, you know, one of my sort of favorite things, which I, again, I, I sort of read about it for the first time from Amos and Yuval's work, I think, uh, or one of the sequence of works, uh, is, a, is a directed graph access structure. Uh, so sort of rather connectivity in a, in a directed graph uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, access structure, you can sort of build an access structure out of it. Um, and, uh, and, and, and again, you know, um, 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 okay, so let me let me say what it is, right? Uh, so, so so you know you have uh, you have n party you have n choose two parties corresponding to all possible edges. Um, rather, let's say uh, two times n choose two parties it correspond to all possible directed edges between graph between sort of nodes, um, and uh, a subset of parties corresponds to a concrete graph, right? So a subset of parties says this edge exists, this edge doesn't exist because it corresponds to a concrete graph. And the question is, is this is there a path from a source a designated source node to a designated sync node in this graph? If yes, you say this set is actually an authorized set, otherwise you say no. And for this, we don't know a polynomial size, uh, uh, a secret sharing scheme with polynomial size shares. This is in contrast to undirected graphs where there is a very simple secret sharing scheme with polynomial size uh, shares. Uh, um, there is a very, very interesting questions for concrete access structures, uh, which, um, which are interesting. So uh, I encourage all the speakers, all the audience to ask. Uh... Yeah, this is the thing, right? I mean, if you let me speak, I'll keep speaking. So if you don't want to hear me anymore, please. So, so I, Vinod, I have a question. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so I have a question. Just is there any sense uh, of how far this type of connection to peer can take you? For example, are there any lower bounds on these peers with linear uh, linear client or, or anything like that? Or can you even hope that it will take you to polynomial share size? So uh, I haven't looked into it that closely, but I, I'm not aware of any lower bounds on uh, linear client uh, pair schemes. Maybe uh, one of the people who know better, like Amos or Yuval can, uh, can correct me. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any lower bounds. Yes. Uh, Adam? I had a question about your last slide. So, um, I don't remember the exact statement, but I remember, you know, uh, Nisim and Noah, Noah and Nisim have a, a, an old result, I mean, relatively old result from maybe 2000 showing that for a general transformation from communication limited, non-secure non protocols okay. to, if I remember correctly, two-party computation of the same functionality uh, with a related communication boundary. And so, so like, you know, roughly 
a transformation to multi-party, you know, two-party computation that has, uh, that, mo that is mostly bound by the communication cost of the original thing rather than its uh, computational cost. Um, I don't remember the exact statement uh, and I might be um, misstating, you know, misstating it, but is there any obstacle to a general statement of that form? Let me pose this as a question. Is a general any obstacle to a general statement that says if you start with a non-private communication protocol that computes some function using, you know, C bits of communication per party or something like that, to turn that into a, a, a multi-party computation protocol with some related uh, communication, maybe plus some additive overhead that depends on the number of parties or something like that. So um... So the thing is, uh, right? If you if you if you only care about sort of non-private, so so non-private uh, communication complexity is only interesting up to the input size, right? Because if you can communicate the input size, it's a uh, you know you can you can sort of uh, you can trivially achieve the, what you want to achieve. Um, right. Uh, whereas here, for, it's far from trivial. The input size is far from trivial. In fact, the trivial thing is two to the input size, right? And that's what we that's what all these sort of peer works sort of. Input. I see. I that's see. General transformation has to blow up the communication complexity or it's doing something uh, something uh, uh, something that we don't know how to do at this point. Uh, I guess uh, one other way to sort of, you know, let me, let me answer your question slightly differently. There is a result of, uh, I believe, uh, Eyal and uh, Yuval who show how to construct uh, a secure multi-party computation protocol for any function using uh, peer protocols. So, so the, the, the idea is that peer is actually kind of a secure, secure to three-party computation protocol where the database is like the truth table, et cetera, et cetera. You can actually make it into a secure three-party protocol, for example, uh, with, uh, in, the, in the normal sense that we think about. It's not like, you know, I can't communicate and you can't communicate really like, you know, you, you, can, you can, can do it. Uh, but the communication cost there is, basically the same as the peer cost. So, so I, I, think, I think the bottom line is that somehow, you know, if you think about non-private protocols, they don't need to talk about computational cost at all, right? And that's why you have the trivial input size upper bound. And for privacy, it seems like so far you do need to talk at least a little bit about the computational cost. And that's, you know, and, and removing that is really the problem. That, that really is the holy grail, right? Uh, so, so I guess, uh, you know, uh, I guess maybe Adam, you actually asked the hardest problem of this entire talk and probably the entire area. Uh, I do, I don't actually know the re re result of Naur and Nisim that you're referencing. Maybe I'll actually go back and look at it, but it cannot be this, uh, that's, that's I'm pretty sure. Okay, so uh, since the time is over and there's no more questions, so uh, thank Vinod for a lovely uh, talk. And uh, we'll convene in the 15 minutes, Adam? Uh, that's right. So the next session starts at uh, noon Eastern, uh, so I guess 4 p.m. UTC. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vinod. Great talk. Thanks. Thank you.